Good evening, dear students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to see so many of you here for the third lecture in our series, The Enigma Man between Antiquity and Today, Das Rätsel Mensch zwischen Antike und Heute, organized by the Zurich Center for the Study of the Ancient World, whose acronym, one must admit, sounds much funkier and cooler in German, ZATZ. My name is Wolfgang Bär and I'm the traditional China chair at the Institute of Asian and Oriental Studies here at the University of Zurich. And uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Kataleine Kops today. I usually work myself on things completely removed from either of your topics, ancient Chinese inscriptions, the way Chinese sounded during the period of Hesiod and Homer. Um, so I will learn together with you today. Maybe because I announced um, an ape name in the title of my own presentation in this series, I was chosen to do this introduction, maybe just out of some contingent do or des logic, and I'm very happy to do that. Katalina Kops is professor at the Department of Anthropology here at Zurich University and director of the SNSF-funded Comparative Human and Ape Technology Project CHAT which investigates the influence of ecological, social, and cognitive factors on the development and evolution of tool use in apes and humans across the African continent, with fieldwork being carried out largely in Guinea, in the DRC, in the Republic of Congo, and Uganda. Uh, Professor Kops received her BSc from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands before moving to Cambridge, uh, where she did her PhD in biological anthropology, and then on to various postdoc positions at Cambridge, at Harvard, before finally coming here, where she has been an SNSF Eccellenza professor since 2021. Publications by Catalina Copes and her various research groups have appeared in what we have come accustomed to call high-impact journals, journals such as Nature, Human Behavior, PNAS, Current Biology, Transactions of the Royal Society, PLOS One, or the International Journal of Primatology. In her work, Professor Kops is focusing on issues such as crab and termite fishing by chimpanzees, or indeed the interaction etiquette which goes along with that nest building by the great apes, hand clapping in groups, um, and some seemingly very human problems as relationship quality and post-conflict anxiety, to quote the title of one paper, or the phylogeny of orangutans, forest people. Many, uh, some of you will know that um, uh, orang in the Malay language means human being and great ape, the same word. We already heard last week uh, what Aristotle had to say about apes at one point during the fine talk by Christoph Rapp and had our first contact with ideas about the importance of primate buttocks, not only to cover the anus, but more importantly to free our hands and thereby to free our minds for what constitutes a human, namely thought, but today we're looking forward to hearing much more sophisticated insights about the commonalities and differences between human and non-human primate behavior. Uh, we will be moving decidedly back into the, the dim and distant past of evolutionary history on the one hand, but on the other hand looking at great uh, ape behavior in their natural habitat in the setting today. So we are very happy to have you, um, very happy that you have kindly agreed to be lured in a situation where you're confronted mostly with classicists and text people, um, and art historians maybe, I don't know. Um, and we're looking forward to your talk on the origins of human technology insights from the great apes. Thank you, Professor Beer, for that very kind introduction, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. As you have heard, my background is indeed not in classics or even in any closely related field, so I'm definitely the outsider in this lecture series. I'm an evolutionary anthropologist, and as you've heard, I study wild great apes. So in my talk today, 
I will tell you about my research on technology and culture in apes, and I will make the case that by studying ape 2 use, we can in turn also shed light on the evolution of technology in our own lineage. I'm going to divide my talk into three parts, which nicely reflects my academic journey. I'm going to start by telling you about my research on chimpanzees. Then we'll look at comparative work on chimpanzees and bonobos, our two closest living relatives. And then finally, I'll tell you a bit about the CHAT project. So this is our current research project, which includes all the African apes as well as humans. But first, how did it all begin? The oldest known hominin stone tool dates to about 3.3 million years ago and was found in West Turkana in Kenya. Then over millions of years, technology evolved from these simple stone tools to more elaborate bifaces and spear points, bows and arrows, needles and pottery, all the way to the complex technology that we have today, which includes things like spaceships. Across the globe, we see this amazing spectrum of cultural diversity, with different peoples using different technologies. And these technologies have helped humans spread all over the world, in places ranging from the Arctic to the desert to the rainforest. Technology is a defining feature of our species. And the question, what makes humans such uniquely technological beings, is akin to asking the fundamental question, what makes us human? So my central research question, therefore, is what drives the evolution of technology? Now, unfortunately, we don't have a time machine to study the use of tools by our hominin ancestors, but we do have the next best thing, our closest living relatives, the great apes. So where fossils are silent, studies of living apes are essential for understanding how and why hominin behavior changed uh, since our lineage split from that of the other apes. The African apes are genetically most closely related to us, and chimpanzees uh, over there are our closest living relatives. And by studying them, we can discover what distinguishes humanity from its ape-like ancestors. Chimpanzees over here are especially informative for the evolution of technology, since they use a wide variety of tools across a range of contexts, just like we do. Now let me give you a very brief background on chimpanzees. Chimpanzee communities, social groups, range in size from about 15 individuals to well over 150. They live in what we call a fission-fusion society. So this means that individuals that all belong to the same community, they're not always together, but they form smaller foraging parties, and these parties are ever-changing in size and composition. Then young female chimpanzees, they disperse to another communities when they reach sexual maturity. And what do they eat? The chimpanzee diet is very diverse, but ripe fruit is one of the most important food sources. But in addition, they also eat other foods, such as leaves, insects, and meat. Chimpanzees are highly social beings, and the most important bond is between a mother and her offspring. Here you see a picture of Ida, the mom, with her newborn son, Iliad. Young chimpanzees spend many, many years in very close association with their mothers. And they are weaned at the age of around five years or so, but even after having been weaned, they still, still spend a lot of time traveling with their moms. Chimpanzees, like us, have very complex social lives. They form long-term friendships and they maintain these social bonds by, for example, grooming and also by supporting each other in conflicts. Chimpanzee communities also have their own social customs. 
This is not Swan Lake. This is a group of chimpanzees that are performing a hand class grooming behavior. And this is in the Kibale forest in Uganda. And this behavior is specific for this group. And they do it in a particular way. They don't do it like this, they do it like this. Other groups might do it like this. And they learn this from their family members and group members. And as I already mentioned, chimpanzees use tools. Some chimpanzee groups crack nuts. Here you see an adult male chimpanzee, he's called Jeje, and he's using, as you can see, a stone hammer and anvil to crack open oil palm nuts. Then other chimpanzee groups dip for army ants. So these are these really aggressive ants that build an underground nest. And this is Guy, she's a female chimpanzee in, Kib in uh, Kalinzu forest in Uganda, and she uses this long tool to swipe the ants into her mouth. And some chimpanzee groups use tools to scoop algae from ponds. This is Jeje again, he really likes to eat, and he's using this long tool to scoop up the algae and fish some out with his hand. And this particular behavior is unique to this community. So meaning that if this group goes, the behavior goes with them. So what we see is that different chimpanzee groups use different types of tools. And we also see that some groups use more tools than others. And these differences in tool use behavior were found to be cultural. So we primatologists and evolutionary anthropologists, we term behavioral variants cultural if they are group typical and depend on social learning for their transmission. So you learn it from others. Now, a lot of research went into figuring out whether chimpanzees and, in fact, other non-human species have culture. First, by showing that behavioral variation across various populations cannot simply be explained by ecological or genetic differences. And then secondly, by using experimental research in captivity to show that social learning processes are indeed involved in the acquisition of tool use. Now, how about tool use in the other primates? As we saw already, humans are the ultimate tool using ape. And diverse tool use is found also in chimpanzees and to a lesser extent in orangutans. Then in wild gorillas, evidence for tool use is almost absent. It's restricted to a few anecdotes of using a stick for postural support to cross a river. And similarly, tool use in wild bonobos is very rare and absent in food acquisition. However, bonobos are capable of making and using tools in captivity. And then more recently, tool use in foraging has been reported in two species of monkeys, capuchin monkeys over here and long-tailed macaques. Now the big question, at least for me, is what explains these differences in primate tool use? The original model of primate tool use suggested that cognition, which includes learning and insight, influences the invention and transmission of tool use. Then sociality, which includes tolerance and gregariousness, was also proposed to influence to use transmission and retention. But, as you can tell by that big black blob above there, there was no mention of the potential influence of the environment. So I set out way back when as a PhD student to address exactly this. How does the environment influence to use and thus culture? So now I'm going to take you on a little trip to Africa, and this will be the roadmap of my talk. So to shed light on the big question, what drives the evolution of technology, I study apes across Africa. First, I'll talk about my work on the role of the environment driving to use at my study site over there in the Nimba Mountains of Guinea in West Africa. And I'm also, now that I have this captive audience, going to introduce you to a few other exciting projects that are not to use related that are ongoing at NIMBA. Secondly, I'll talk about my comparative research on chimpanzees in Uganda and bonobos in the, Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Both are closest living relatives. 
And then lastly, I'll briefly introduce you to the ongoing research project, which includes all the African apes, as well as humans, all living in the Congo Basin Forest. So let's start off with the work on chimpanzees in West Africa. I'm going to, going to introduce you to my favorite place on Earth, my study site in the Nimba Mountains. The Nimba Mountains are situated about a thousand kilometers from the capital Conakry on the coast. And that is a thousand kilometers on roads like this. So after two day drive on these kinds of uh, surfaces, we reach the village of Seringbara that you see behind me. And from here we walk for another couple of hours to our field camps. The Nimba Mountains are covered in dense primary rainforest with steep cliffs, very fast flowing rivers and some beautiful high altitude savannas. We have two base camps in the middle of the rainforest and this includes some sleeping huts, we have a kitchen and we even have a shower. And when the chimpanzees move too far from camp, then we just simply pack our bags, take our tents, and we sleep wherever the night finds us. I established the Nimba study site in 2003, so that's exactly 20 years ago now. And this is what the team looked like in the early days. This is what the team looked like a decade later. And then finally, I was able to return, actually a few weeks ago, I was there, and last summer, again after COVID, and research is going strong with our team of local Guinean researchers running the project um, marvelously. And these are some of our chimpanzees. Our research focuses on two communities, so two, two different social groups, and we have three ways of collecting data. We collect behavioral observations of the chimpanzees whenever possible. But these chimpanzees, as you can see, live in extremely rugged terrain. So if they want, they can just get away. So they are not completely habituated, as we call that, to human observers. So what else do we do? We also use motion-triggered camera traps. As you can see here, we have about 40 or 50 up in the forest now, so it's like Big Brother. And this is a great way of collecting data without researchers being present. And then we also study indirect evidence, so a little bit like archaeologists. We study the tools that the chimpanzees leave behind. Now before we dive deeper into the topic of tool use and what and our tool use findings at NIMBA, I want to just briefly introduce you to some exciting recent findings and current projects. As already mentioned, I'll introduce you to the first evidence of crab fishing by wild chimpanzees. Then I'll tell you a little bit about work on chimpanzee sociality and grouping patterns at NIMBA. We'll have a quick look at exciting new work on buttress drumming, chimpanzees drum as well. And then lastly, I want to briefly introduce you to our biomonitoring project, which covers a large part of the Nimba Mountains Reserve. So first, crab fishing. We discovered that Nimba chimpanzees eat freshwater crabs, and this is the first record of a non-human ape consuming crabs, and it's also the first evidence of chimpanzees eating aquatic fauna, so we were very excited. And as you can see here, the chimpanzees, they search in these riverbeds, and they disturb the surface with their hands and pick out the crabs. So what did we find? The chimpanzees eat crabs year-round, and that's not related to the availability of ripe fruit, their favorite food. And then interestingly, crab fishing was done most and for longest durations by females and their offspring. And then lastly, nutritional analyses showed that these crabs are really high in both salt and calcium, and this may be a really important source of these micronutrients. And we are currently looking at how young chimpanzees learn to eat crabs, and also why not all communities in Nimba exploit this resource. And this is work by my collaborator, Dr. Lara van Holstein. Then chimpanzee sociality. Here we see a chimpanzee traveling party or subgroup. 
As I told you, they live in this fission fusion society. So this is one particular group on one particular day. We have adult females in the back with their offspring. One of the males is coming up to the camera. And as you can see, these camera traps are really a unique way of gaining insights into the lives of these chimpanzees. And of course, we all like babies, so I'll show you here one of the newest members of our community. You can see on her, on her belly. And this was work done by uh, Kelly Van Leeuwen, my master's student at the time, and she was interested in finding what is the best method to measure chimpanzee party size. So she set out to compare three different measures. She looked at direct observations, so literally us observing the chimps. She looked at measures from nest counts, so these are the beds that chimpanzees make to sleep in at night. And she also looked at data from the motion-triggered cameras. Now, what did she discover? She found out that the motion-triggered cameras were the best, best represented chimpanzee party size and also most accurately reflected the effects of ecological and social factors. So we saw clear effects of fruit abundance and the presence of estrus females. So this showed that camera trap findings are really an exciting way of studying these wild chimpanzees and we are now continuing this work by looking at differences between West African chimpanzees and East African chimpanzees that seem to have markedly different ways of living together. And this is work together with my collaborator, Dr. Kat Hobater from the University of St. Andrews. <laughs> This is chimpanzee buttress drumming, an adult male drumming on a huge buttress tree. And you can hear that he gets a response from chimpanzees in the distance. This is research by my then PhD student and now collaborator, Dr. Megan Fitzgerald. And she was interested in finding out uh, whether chimpanzees are selective, first of all, as to which trees they drum on, and secondly, as to which buttresses they select. So what she did is she compared buttresses that were drummed on and buttresses that were not used, and she found that, yes, indeed, chimpanzees prefer not only certain tree species, but they even have a preference for certain buttresses. They select buttresses that have larger surface areas and are thinner, so basically more resonant substrates. And this uh, preference for these really basically very effective uh, buttresses, supports the function of drumming in long-distance communication. And we are currently interested in looking at selectivity in terms of uh, drumming tree location. So are they picking trees on ridges from where the sound travels very far? And this is work currently ongoing. And then a few words before returning, I promise you, to tool use about our biomonitoring efforts in NIMBA. Firstly, we've been using genetic analyses to establish how many chimpanzees live in this area. So we basically collect chimpanzee poo. It's very glamorous. And then we do analysis in the lab. And based on about 700 samples, we could establish that there are two communities in the study site, as you can see here, and then another community to the north of it. And this genetics work was done with my collaborators at Copenhagen Zoo. And then in addition to these genetic samples, we set up this huge uh, network of camera traps across the whole Nimba mountain range. So these are all the little white dots that you can see. And we found that, very excitingly, the first sightings of leopards in the study site. So it seems like leopards have come back. And also, very interestingly, we discovered what very much looked like leprosy. This chimpanzee has lesions all over the face, and we are now doing analyses uh, to see wh what strain of leprosy we have in these chimpanzees. So this is just to, uh, to illustrate that the, the value of using these camera traps and of looking beyond chimpanzees, but also monitoring wildlife across the mountains. All right, Nimba to use. Let's get back to technology. What types of tools do we find in NIMBA? A few years ago now, we discovered a new type of tool called Traculia fracturing. 
This is a type of percussive technology and it involves the use of stone and wooden cleavers to crack open these really large and fibrous fruits of Truculia africana. So they're very difficult to get your teeth into. They can be even as big as this. And we found that chimpanzees use stones or sticks to, to, to break them open. And here you can see one of the laterite stones that they use to crack open the fruit. And then the second type of tool used in Nimba is andipping, of which you already saw a video earlier on. We found that the chimpanzees were selective as to which plants they use, which species they use to make tools. And we also discovered that they use two different types of tools. So this is what we call a tool set, consisting of a digging and then a dipping tool. And here you can see the two types of tools left behind in an ant nest. However, one thing that was very interesting is that chimpanzees in Nimba do not crack nuts, even though close by neighbors in Bosu do, and they also do not fish for termites. So now remember that my research question in Nimba was, how does the environment influence tool use? So I set out to test two not mutually exclusive hypotheses. The opportunity hypothesis, which states that encounter rates with resources are important in determining the use of foraging tools. And then the second hypothesis is the necessity hypothesis, which states that tool use is a response to the scarcity of preferred foods, which, as I said, in the case of chimpanzees, is ripe fruit. Now, I'll spare you all the graphs, but basically I can tell you what we found is that Yes, we found support for the opportunity hypothesis. To use at NIMBA could indeed be explained by the opportunities to encounter specific resources requiring to use. Whereas we found no support for the necessity hypothesis. Low fruit availability, in fact, did not lead to more to use. So these findings suggest that ecological opportunity rather the necessity may be the mother of invention. And then in fact, findings on the three species of tool using primates, so chimpanzees, capuchins, and orangutans, show that the ecological opportunities to encounter resources requiring tool use explained tool use patterns. So in other words, we can revise the original model and we can now add an explicit role for the environment. Now I wondered what happens when we crank up the ecological opportunities for tool use. So we set up a series of nut cracking field experiments in which we provided nuts and stones in order to see whether the Nimba chimpanzees would go on to invent this tool use behavior. Remember, they do not crack nuts. So what we did is we applied an ecologically valid field experimental approach. We tested the chimpanzees for an extended period of time. We did this for over a year. And we tested Western chimpanzees, so West African chimpanzees that are known to crack nuts. The, the subspecies is these chimpanzees are not. And we wanted to answer the question, do chimpanzees individually invent nut cracking when provided with the necessary materials? So we ran four experiments at what we call outdoor laboratories. These are basically places in the forest where we set up cameras and we put the nuts and stones in front of the cameras. In the first experiment, we provided the chimpanzees just with oil palm nuts and stones. So we provided two of these little piles. Then in experiment two, we provided nuts, stones, and also the oil palm fruit, uh, just to see whether chimpanzees were at all familiar with this food source. Then in experiment three, we also placed already cracked nuts on top of the stones. And in experiment four, we provided the chimpanzees with Kula edulis nuts. And this is a type of nuts that chimpanzees really love and very commonly crack. So potentially a nut that's more readily crackable than oil palm nuts. And as said, we ran these experiments for more than a year. So what happened? Here you see a video of the very first time that the chimpanzees visited the experimental site. 
We have this adolescent male who's called Pony, and he's picking up the nuts, having a sniff. There are two adult males here in the back. He's also having a sniff. They're completely puzzled as to where, why these nuts and stones appeared in their forest. Then there's a female coming over. She's not quite sure what's going on. The male is going over to his buddies in the back. She's having a sniff. <laughs> and then, after investigating the nuts and the stones for quite a while, he turned his attention to the camera. <laughs> and as it, is, as it turns out, you have a reflection of yourself in the camera lens, so he's using this as a mirror. And he's checking if I move, does the little chimp in the mirror move as well. Now, all his friends have already left, so then he realizes, oops, time to go. And then this particular chimp really took camera investigation to the next level. He created a tool to investigate the camera. So this was most definitely not the kind of tool use that I was expecting at my nutcracking experiment, but interesting nonetheless. So what did we find with regards to the nutcracking? Overall, we did have 35 chimpanzee parties visiting the experimental site, of which 11 parties closely investigated the items at the site. They visited the experiments across experimental phases. It was pretty constant. And the mean party size of the visits was about three individuals. But, as you can see, no nut was cracked. We had, in 19 out of 99 individual chimpanzee visits, chimpanzees that were closely exploring the nuts, and in, as you can see, zero cases did they actually crack. So what does this all mean? What can we conclude from this? So despite testing for over a year under natural conditions, nut cracking did not emerge. And our findings suggest that chimpanzees really require another chimpanzee to learn from and that nutcracking is indeed a product of what we call social learning. And our findings also suggest that this composite tool use, so having a hammer and an anvil, really is potentially too complex to be readily invented by just any one individual. So, all that said, this brings us to the second part of my talk, where we're going to look a little bit more at comparative research on chimpanzees and bonobos. And this comparison focuses on chimpanzees in Kalim Kalinzu Forest and bonobos in Wamba. Now remember, chimpanzees and bonobos are equally closely related to us. You can see them up here. And they uh, diverge from uh, the human lineage for about one million years ago. So they are equally closely related to us, yet they differ drastically in their use of technology. As you've already heard, chimpanzees are renowned for their extensive use of foraging tools, whereas bonobos over here use very few tools in the wild and none in food acquisition. So I wanted to investigate what explains this two-use difference and what are the roles of ecological, social and cognitive factors. So what did I do? A postdoc at the time, I went out to Congo and Uganda and measured the ecological opportunities in terms of insect and nut availability for both chimpanzees at Kalinsu and bonobos at Wamba. So just to illustrate what these findings look like for the bonobos, here we have bonobo follows, so basically me with a GPS going after the bonobos, following them all day. And then these dots that you can see are army ant encounters. So you can see that army ants actually occur across the ranges of these bonobos. And then similarly, macro termes termites, so these are the ones that make these huge mounds from which you can nicely fish, they also occur across the home ranges of these two bonobo groups. So ecological opportunities in terms of resource availability really could not explain the difference in tool use between chimpanzees and bonobos. Bonobos, in fact, had plentiful opportunities to use tools. 
So second, we looked at the social opportunities in terms of the number of social partners that they interact with, as well as the feeding proximity to others. So how much time do you spend eating close to your buddies, which makes it possible to learn from them? So first, the number of social partners gives a nice indication of the number of potential models to learn from. And here we have chimpanzees in blue and bonobos in red and the number of social partners on the y-axis. And what we see is that young bonobos had more social partners than young chimpanzees from whom to potentially learn. The next, feeding in close proximity to others provides potentially a more direct way of assessing learning opportunities in the relevant context of feeding. Here we have the proportion of feeding time spent in close proximity to others. And what we found is that young bonobos actually spend more time feeding close to others than young chimpanzees and thus have more opportunities to potentially learn feeding skills from others. So what we would really predict based on social opportunities is that bonobos would use more, more tools than chimpanzees, but they clearly don't. So social opportunities in itself could not explain the difference in tool use. And then thirdly, we assessed a potential difference in the predisposition or motivation for tool use by comparing object manipulation in young chimpanzees and bonobos. So basically, how much time do they spend playing around investigating objects in their daily lives? Object manipulation changes from this non-goal-directed exploration of, for example, sticks or leaves into goal-directed tool use like hand dipping and leaf sponging as chimpanzees mature. So object manipulation is therefore considered the developmental precursor of tool use. So what does object manipulation look like? Here you see an example of chimpanzee object manipulation. This is a seven-year-old female. She's called Iku. She is making a probing tool. I hope you can see it. And she's investigating a hole in a dead tree. So some object manipulation is actual tool use, uh, but most of it involves behaviors like exploring, carrying, playing, or breaking objects. And then here we have another example of chimpanzee object manipulation. This is Ayu in the back, she's three years old, and Mugisha in the front, he is a one-year-old male. And they are having a marvelous time playing together with a leaf. And this is what we call social object play. Until, unfortunately, the leaf fell down and the game was over. And then here we have an example of object manipulation in bonobos. This is a one and a half year old male, he's called Siko, and he is having a great time playing with this stick. So this is what we call solitary object play. And you can hear all the sweat bees going around my head. <laughs> so what did we find in this study? Here we see object manipulation rates on the y-axis for chimpanzees, again in blue, and bonobos in red. And what we see was as predicted, higher rates of object manipulation in chimpanzees as compared to bonobos. And strikingly, this difference was already very clear in very young individuals, and thus suggesting a potential innate predisposition for object interest in chimpanzees. And this is one of the things we are now investigating uh, with much more data. And then we also compared object manipulation types between the two species, so what do they do with these objects? And we looked specifically at the contribution of play. So here we have in gray play and in the colors different types, uh, different other types of object manipulation like throwing or dropping objects. And what we can see here is that object manipulation by young bonobos consists of much more non-goal-directed object play as compared to chimpanzees on the right. And object manipulation in chimpanzees is also much more diverse, indicated by these different colors uh, in the graph. So, we found that the 
predisposition or the motivation or whatever you want to call it to interact with objects did play a really important role in explaining the species difference in two use. Chimpanzees had higher object manipulation rates and they had more diverse and more goal-directed manipulation types. So to summarize what we've seen up to now, we saw that ecological opportunities are really important in explaining two-use differences in a two-using species like chimpanzees. And we also saw that the intrinsic predisposition for two-use was important in explaining species differences between chimpanzees and bonobos. But now you're all wondering, there is of course one key species missing from this comparison, right? How about humans? How do we humans fit in? What are the roles of environmental, social and cognitive factors in differences in technology between humans and the other apes? So this brings us to the third and final part of my talk. I will now briefly introduce to you our current project, which includes all African apes as well as humans, all living in the Congo Basin Forest. So this is funded by an excellent sub-professorial fellowship. Um, this comparative human and ape technology or CHAT project. And this is the first comparative study of tool use to include all the African apes as well as humans in the same comparative framework. And this project is unique in the sense that we actually keep the environmental context as good as constant because all species are living in the Congo Basin rainforest. And as you can see, this is of course a huge collaborative effort. We, work, we are working on this with a team of great scientists. So by including all the African apes as well as humans in the same comparative framework, we are hoping to shed light on the mechanisms that underlie human technology and set it apart from other ape species. And the diversity of tool using skills across the African clade really provides a natural opportunity to uh, implement such a comparative approach to investigate how technology evolved. And then in addition, we take a developmental perspective to uh, investigate the differences in tool use between humans and other apes. So we're comparing tool use development across humans and apes, and we're trying to link the ontogenetic trajectories to ecological and social developmental inputs. So the chat project includes chimpanzees, gorillas, and Bayaka foragers all living in the Republic of Congo, as well as bonobos living in neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. And as you can see, this is all within the Congo Basin Forest. So two PhD students have recently joined my group and they will be doing lots of fun field work, one actually left today, uh, on the chat project in the very near future. And then in addition, we'll have a master's student and a postdoc arriving this summer. So very exciting times for us. So the CHAP project uses this comparative approach that I mentioned. First, comparative research in natural, ecological and social settings is really important for determining the factors which prompted differences in technology to emerge among humans and apes. And secondly, including both apes and humans in the same comparative study is key to determining what, uh, to what extent apes and humans also share traits that underlie tool use. And then as said, we combine this comparative with a developmental approach. First, ontogenetic stages are often given less attention than adult forms, even though changes in developmental trajectories can be really important and have large effects on adult phenotypes. And then second, developmental research often compares individuals across age classes rather than following an individual's development over time. And this kind of individual level longitudinal study is really important and needed to link ontogenetic trajectories to these different ecological and social developmental inputs. So here is our three-factor model again that you may remember from the beginning. 
In the CHAT project, we will build on previous work by investigating the roles of the environment, of sociality and of cognition. But in addition, we will now add the ontogenetic background on which the development of two use takes place. Then how, now there's a little sneak peek, so before wrapping up, I'll give you a glimpse of some of the initial findings already coming in from gorilla field work at the Mondika field site, directed by my collaborator Cricket Sons and Dave Morgan. And we had no idea whether these non tool using apes would do anything with objects at all. So we were extremely excited to find that, yes, young gorillas do all sorts of things with objects, they explore them. They carry them, they throw them, they break them, it's like my daughter. They bite them and they also play with them. And then most interestingly, they actually also seem to use them as what you might call tools. So let's have a look. Here we have Cow, a young gorilla who is very keen to play with a silverback over there. That's Loya. And as you can see, he's using a twig to invite the silverback to play with him. So under most definitions, this would actually qualify as tool use. So we might call this social tool use. Data collection is currently ongoing. Um, so a lot more data will come in to look at patterns of object manipulation in gorillas, bonobos, humans, chimpanzees, and we can't wait to see what we find. So to sum up, the CHAP project uses this comparative developmental approach to examine the evolution of tool use across the African apes and humans. And we integrate this approach with the explicit testing of both ecological and socio-cognitive hypotheses. The ecological hypotheses include the necessity as well as the opportunity hypotheses about which you've already heard earlier. And then we'll also be using some very novel approaches, including physiological measures of energy balance to address uh, the relative profitability hypotheses. In addition, we'll be looking at the energetic costs and benefits of tool use compared to foraging without tools. Then on the other hand, we are also considering the socio-cognitive hypotheses, including the exploratory tendency hypotheses, Remember the chimpanzee bonobo difference in object manipulation. We're now going to look at this across all apes and humans. The social learning hypotheses, which will look at the role of different learning mechanisms. How do you learn to use tools? Do you watch somebody? Is somebody teaching you? How is this different across species? And then lastly, we'll be looking at the cultural intelligence hypotheses, which will consider the role of social learning opportunities, for example, by looking at social networks of apes living in different groups. And this integrated approach is crucial to understanding the processes shaping variation in technology across species, both during development and across evolutionary time. And then finally, understanding to use as an adaptation is essential for identifying factors which have prompted to use across a range of primates and promoted the exceptional flourishing of technology in our own lineage. And with that, I'd like to thank many people and many places, study, uh, students and research assistants for their invaluable help in the field, collaborators and colleagues for their support, and a number of funding sources for their financial contributions. And with that, I thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for a really fascinating panorama of what you do, what your work is. Uh, I open the floor for questions, comments, ideas, bewilderments. Yes, please. Right. Um, thank you very much. Um, you were warned that there are people here um, who are concerned with text, and people who are concerned with text are concerned with words. Um, you used the, the, the words tool and technology almost interchangeably, and I was wondering whether you think they're really the same or whether there's a difference. 
Um, and I have another question. Um, you pointed out that this use of um, combined tool, use of an anvil with a stone is really quite advanced. Um, it's also something that I, I think otters do to crack open mussels. They, they use anvils and, and stones. So that, that is somewhat surprising in the context of your talk because that would assume or suggest that they are really super intelligent if they have this combined tool use. Yeah, so first about the terminology. So we, we, tool use, we talk about different types of tool use behaviors. And in technology, when we look at chimpanzees, we usually call it elementary technology. And then we might also look at behaviors like nest building, which under the definition of tool use is not a detached object, so hence not tool use, but it also involves uh, skill and, and learning, etc. So I've also looked, at, I didn't talk about this today, but more at how do they build their nest? How do they learn to build their nest? How do they adapt building their nest to different conditions, etc.? So, yeah, I would say technology kind of uh, encompasses more than just tools. And then, secondly, otters. Yes, indeed. Um, I think what's interesting about chimpanzees is that they don't only crack nuts, but they have this really diverse, they're not a one-trick pony, they use tools for all sorts of purposes, and they're also very flexible in their tool use. So they, they will adapt the size of the hammer to the hardness of the nuts, and they will have preference for certain combinations of hammers and anvils because they work really well together. So it doesn't mean that the behavior... Um, in itself, I mean, I, I'm also very impressed by otters, by the way, nothing against otters. But um, it's, so it's interesting to see how this behavior independently evolved in this very d far away lineages. And that's why we were shocked as chimpologists when we found out that also capuchin mon monkeys crack nuts. We're like, whoa, we didn't expect that. So studying also these more distantly related texts is really interesting to see what, what drives this and how it can emerge in these different lineages. I'm looking any... for bewilderment. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, well, as we describe as people of text and literature, I was thinking uh, during your talk that there are some reports in ancient texts concerning special behaviors of animals. The most famous one is the story of Cain and Abel, which the, he sees a crew that buries another, another crew and learns how to bury his brother. And uh, I was pers I'm personally thinking of searching if crew really does it or if there is a, a special population of crews or beds that do it, that that reflection exists in um, ancient texts. So uh, I wonder that if... Uh, in your research or people who work on this uh, discipline are people who actually try to compare uh, such uh, the behaviors that you find with the attestations of behaviors of animals in, in ancient texts in general. Yeah, mm. thank you. That sounds, that's really fascinating. Yeah, I think we probably read not enough compared to all of you guys, but um, there are actually the first reports of, of chimpanzee nutcracking didn't come from scientists, but it was from uh, people way back when in West Africa who had seen this behavior. So I think w our version of using wisdom that already exists is also really to, to work with local people and to work together and to listen to their stories about... Um, how, how they see that they came about, but their stories of chimpanzees. They see chimpanzees as their ancestors, so they're a totem animal that you cannot eat or hunt because it's, you know, your ancestors. So I think that's our way of also trying to look at this from different angles because, yeah, there's the, 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 the written record only goes back so far for, for West Africa, for example. And another way of doing that is that some colleagues have, have started the field of primate archaeology. So they're ex actually excavating... Uh, nutcracking sites of chimpanzees and going back uh, in time and found that some of these sites really have been there for thousands of years. So there's really a, a, a deep history even of the behavior in chimpanzees that we can see uh, still there in the forest. And the same goes for capuchin monkeys. I would like to go uh, back to this group of chimpanzees who did, which did not develop nutcracking with stones, although having been provided with every, everything necessary for it for over a year or almost yeah. a year. Uh, you see, this cracking of nets, nuts with stones could 
develop in two ways. Either you, you have already some uh, experience uh, with the object of stone and uh, you have handled it for a while and done a lot of different things with it. And then you see an object which contains something you desire and then you could um, develop the internal vision. I could use that stone for getting what is in that object. Yeah. Uh, that would be a deliberate act. Uh, which has the ne ne necessary <laughs> precondition that you have an experience with stones. Um, and the other thing, the other possible way would be that you accidentally uh, discover the possibility of cracking nuts with stones. And I'm asking myself, whether this um, set of experiments you described for one year um, was, was uh, made uh, in the hope that they would accidentally discover uh, that possibility, which leads me to the question, did these chimpanzees um, before have... Uh, an extended um, uh, experience with handling of stones, or did they not have it? Yeah, no, that's, a, and that's an excellent question. So we didn't actually introduce anything new to their environment. We just brought it, brought it to a place in the forest where I could see what they would do with it. So stones are all over the forest. We just put them in one place, and, um, and then we put the nuts right next to it, which normally maybe doesn't occur, but they had experience with both materials, but didn't put one and one together. And to be honest, I never thought that they would. I wanted to test whether or not the knowledge already existed, but then many people uh, in my field have suggested, but not cracking is so simple. Surely if you just provide it to chimpanzees, they'll start cracking. And I was like, oh, I actually did the experiment <laughs> 10 years ago. Shall I publish it? So that's how it came about. I wanted to see whether they knew whether there was one individual there who actually had that cultural knowledge which there wasn't, but then in addition, I was also testing whether they would come up with it. But um, if, you, if you see a young chimpanzee learn how to crack nuts, they are really observing their mom doing it, and then they eat a bit of the nuts, and they spent years watching their mom. So, so I didn't actually think they would just magically come up with it, but it was a nice test of what other people thought would be possible. I wanted to ask another question, but it's very fascinating, this discussion, because, I mean, in the philosophical realm, of course, you have this kind of accidental learning, and then according to also in Aristotle, then it builds up to experience, and from experience comes knowledge, and then comes thinking, and I mean, this is the way we, 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 we went through as human beings in a way. It's very fascinating, just this observation. But my question was regarding the buttress drumming. I found that also extremely fascinating, this kind of dialogical communication communication, is this just playing around or because I mean they may disappear and then the other one reacts as we can see it also in birds sometimes one has the impression also blackbirds do this kind of communication with each other when they sing or is it also that do you think that they want to get the message through for instance also making alarm there are cameras around there are human beings around or, I mean can you make out what the, 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 the function of this but drumming is really yeah no it, it is fascinating and they definitely are communicating with others so they they will drum I, I have gazillion videos of this so sometimes there will be a male coming along on his own and he drums and then he sits and he really waits and listens and if nothing happens he'll drum again so you have this really this like response waiting and then other times you see others respond and then they're like, okay, we're going this way. So they, they, it's, it's a way of communicating, I'm here, where are you? We're here. And uh, actually this, this, this colleague I mentioned earlier, Kat Hobater, she's just published a paper looking at individual signatures in drumming. So you can actually tell chimpanzees apart by the way they drum in combination with this kind of pant hoot that they do. So they go, <laughs> and then they drum as well. And if you have the two, I mean, I can tell them apart by their pant hoots, but the drumming itself also is very 
distinct for different individuals. So it's really a way of saying, okay, cat's here, and then you're like, okay, yeah, Johnny's here. Or if you don't want cat to know where you are, you just kind of like quietly don't respond, and then Johnny gets really annoyed. So yeah, they are definitely trying to communicate. And one of the things that we want to look at is that are they also smart in which trees and which buttresses they pick that actually work best? Because if the buttresses is a bit too big, it just doesn't resonate well. It just hurts really <laughs> a lot to hit it. But if it's nice and thin, it really produces a uh, sound that travels for kilometers. There's a gentleman on the other side. Um, I have a question about uh, the, the nut cracking phenomenon. So the, the groups that, that learn not, are not cracking um, with social learning. So uh, I, I just wondered, they must how how did they invent this? So that there must have been like a, the first ape that yeah. in, invented it and can give this knowledge to the the next generation. Yeah. So did you find out something about that? Is it, was that some sort of coincidence or? I think you're like reviewer too. This is an excellent point, and it links to what your colleague was saying over there. At some point, somewhere, there must have been some Einstein chimpanzee that either had some coincidental nut that was cracked and put one and one together. So somebody, of course, must have invented it at some point, one chimpanzee, but what we tried to show is that what was claimed is that it's so simple. Anybody, the claim was that any individual chimpanzee individually invents this behavior. So it's not culture, it's just that everybody who finds these materials then invents it themselves. And that really is extremely unlikely because it's complex. But some in chimpanzee did, be it luck, be it Einstein chimp, who knows, did invent it. And what we see is that it only occurs in West Africa. And it occurs in an area until you hit the Sassandra River and then it's absent. So it spread seemingly until it hit a geographical barrier and then all the chimps on the other side of the river all the way to Tanzania do not crack nuts, even though they have nuts in their environment and the stones. So it really, you have this kind of nut cracking zone. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the talk and also for these results. Uh, just a side um, question. In anthropology, we work with a concept of technological choices. And we know very well that you can put an invention in certain social environments and they are not taken because they fail. And the reason is not that people are not intelligent or that they don't understand it, they just can't use it. It's just of no use. So I wonder if you uh, investigated if there's other reasons for not nut cracking than a, a, a missing Einstein. Yeah, so that was kind of part of my, uh, which I, I went over pretty quickly, but during my PhD, I wanted to look at what does the environment, how does that play a role? And what we find in Nimba is that there are nut cracking, nut bearing trees, there are stones, but they're pretty peripheral to where the chimpanzees range because they mainly occur at lower altitude. The chimps like to be a bit higher up. So they encounter them very rarely. So the chances of Einstein coming up with nut cracking are very, very low. So what probably happened in the case of Nimba because their neighbors in Bosu that I showed you on the video crack nuts, is that the behavior m may have existed in the larger population but went extinct because if you have so few opportunities to encounter the resource together with somebody who knows how to do it, then a behavior can also disappear again. So, yeah, if they knew how to do it, um, it would of course be a very rich resource to use, but you don't encounter nuts very often. So yeah, energetically, it might also, if, even if you knew how to do it, you wouldn't be doing it day in, day out. So ecology plays a role for sure. And then the interaction between how many resources there are and how, uh, when you are there with other individuals all plays together. Does that answer your question? Not really, but... <laughs> <laughs> Some bewilderment. <laughs> Yeah, but my, my question comes from a different angle. Uh, I think at a certain point you will be able to say it's a question uh, posed by a lawyer. Uh, it has to do with culture, because you have presented very impressive examples of group culture. Uh, you have also presented tool use as potentially part of it. Uh, and this is, of course, transmitted. Uh, and I wonder uh, if uh, these forms of culture that you have observed together with the enabling function that makes it possible for the next generation to do something, 
if they do, and now comes the lawyer, if they may also have a prescriptive function in which expectations are there, and therefore uh, they, they tend to be fulfilled and there might even be a negative uh, consequence if they are not. I mean, maybe I'm pushing things too far, but... No, not at all. This is like this is a hot topic. Like, is there, are there things like norms in chimpanzees? And and it's an open question. The jury is still out. Because we, what we see is, I didn't present this, but I looked in Uganda to neighboring groups of chimpanzees dipping for ants. They live in the same forest with the same ants. Like, it's literally the same. Yet one group uses really long tools and the other uses really short tools. Now, as I also told you, female chimpanzees, they, they move to a different community when they reach 12, 13 years old. So how can you maintain short tools and long tools in neighboring community if females don't change their behavior? Because otherwise you wouldn't expect. So, so when, I'm, when I'm a female going to a new group, why do I change the way I do things? Is it because it's just smartest to do what the locals do because the locals will know best? Or is it because I want to fit in and I should do as the locals do? And this is really hard to test, but it's, it's really interesting. And um, yeah, people are trying to also address this with kind of experimental setups. Thank you very much for the talk. I have a question about cultural transmission. If I remember correctly, David Premer came some 30 or 40 years ago with that idea that the fundamental difference between chimps and human beings is that the human mothers teach their children, correct them, whereas in chimps, uh, the babies just have to observe and copy and no intervention by the mothers in the learning process. Is that still current wisdom? It still holds Pretty much, but there in, in the, again, in the case of nut cracking, there are some observations of moms adjusting a little bit the behavior of the young, but very few. One, uh, observa one, one, one behavior in which there seems to be something that functions as teaching is termite fishing with a tool set. So you need different types of tools for different parts of the job. And there we see that moms often share their tools with their offspring. So in a way, they learn the properties of the tools from the moms, and it, one definition of teaching says that if it's beneficial for the learner and uh, um, it's energetically costly for the teacher, we should call it teaching. So under that definition, you could call it teaching. So this tool sharing might be a way of learning from your mom, but it's not the case that moms will be like, no, do it like this, do it like that. That's still a very um, different way of learning in humans and chimps. Now the question is, in humans, we also have a lot of learning without teaching. And when do we teach and when don't we teach? And does it have to do with tool co task complexity? And that's some of the things we're looking at with the comparative work. When do we use what social learning mechanisms, basically? Hello. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've actually got a question for one of the graphs you showed us. Um, it was bonobos and chimpanzees using tools with different frequencies. Now, the graph seems to converge the older they get. Yeah. Um, do you have any explanation for that? So this is object manipulation in general. So it seems that when chimpanzees, more so than bonobos, are young, they're really exploring a lot uh, what are the properties of objects, like kids do, really. And as they get older, they do less of this overall object manipulation. But then what wasn't in the graph is that tool use for chimpanzees, of course, kind of goes up or like they get better at it and they keep doing it and bonobos don't. But the overall object manipulation might be much more about learning all the properties of objects. So you see very young ones manipulating with objects a lot, including like carrying it, biting it, playing. But then as you figure out, okay, leaves are all about that and sticks are all about that, you kind of see it go down exactly. There's this developmental pattern. Yeah, but I didn't plot in this graph to you specifically for chimpanzees. So object manipulation, indeed, they all, at some point around seven or eight years, do much less of it. But chimpanzees are using tools throughout their lives, and bonobos just do very little with objects altogether. Yeah. Are there any further questions? Yes, please. Hi, I've got a question about the evolution of technology because in, for humans we normally say, oh, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of our technolo 
technology evolves through war. So we try to find better methods to kill somebody or something like that. Is there anything similar to seeing apes or chimpanzees? Well, chimpanzees kind of have their, their weapons built in, right? They have these giant canines, so they can easily kill each other without weapons, uh, and, and they do, uh, and bonobos don't, which is interesting as well. So the only observations of chimpanzees using weapons, so to speak, is, 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 is spears that they use in hunting for little bush babies. Bush babies are these like nocturnal primates that sleep during the day in a tree, and then chimpanzee comes and goes stab, but they don't use any... Uh, weapons to fight each other because, well, those really don't need to. They're brutal with their canines and physical force. If I may venture one question myself, if linguists try to differentiate what is specific about human language, one argument very often brought about is recursiveness, the possibility to embed one sentence in a relative clause, the man who saw that and so on and so forth, uh, ad, ad infinitum. So if one tries to translate that to a situation like that, one could think about a special cognitive function being to use tools to make tools, secondary tool use. Now we saw sets of tools in your presentation, and I think in Crows it has been documented there's secondary tool use. Is there anything like that? Taking a stone to make a tool which then serves to do something else with it. No, we see tool making, tool modification, but we don't see using a tool to make another tool to do something else. So it's more yeah, making something, and sometimes you need multiple some things to do something, but no, not making tools, or using a tool to make a tool. Because it would involve some, some consciousness of planning and execution, which uh, also involves some kind of memory and maybe a cultural memory of what has been useful before in order to take a tool to make, to make another tool. Yeah. So there are these experiments with crows where they make a little stick in order to make another stick in order to get into the box where the nut is. Yeah, we do see that they you m make multiple tools to get to use sequentially to get to something, okay. but they don't use uh, I don't know a, a stone to sharpen a stick to then use the sharpened okay. stick. Mm -hmm. But again, chimpanzees have you know very sharp teeth, so right. <laughs> in certain ways, like what 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 would they need that for? And they don't cut things, right? Like also they don't they don't make uh, flakes to cut things because again you can just bite it open. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to, uh, well, one of the things that people are looking at more and more is, it, is kind of the, the sequences of behavior and, and whether we see a, any kind of, like the, the order of not cracking and how that relates to language, that those are links that people are trying to make. What are the critical elements of not cracking? How do they kind of, how are they combined um, to see whether that is at all related to how we use language? Yes, please. I have another question, but uh, not um, dealing with uh, tool use. <laughs> um, I found it very fascinating to see that group of clapping, yeah. hand clapping. And uh, I would like to know whether they have a sort of uh, specific rhythm, and if so, what sort of rhythm do they Ooh. prefer? <laughs> yeah, no, it's hand clasping. So it's like if I would groom with him, I would, we would hold hands like this, and then we would groom. But we're not actually clapping, we're clasping, like holding. And then there's different ways you could do it like this, or you could do it like this. And certain families have the way of doing it like this, others like this, others just touch. So there seem to be family-specific ways of... of grooming that are specific for this one room. No, we do, have, we do have some evidence of Nimba chimpanzees clapping hands. That was kind of more to try to scare us away, that they would go... And we have a few observations, but not enough to say anything solid about it. So we do sometimes see clapping, but in this case it's hand clasping. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> Disappointing chimpanzees. <laughs> I think clapping hands was the right question to conclude. <laughs> Thanks for a fascinating talk again. And hope to see many of you around next week.